So welcome everyone to the Stockbridge Library Association's online poetry series. We are now in season three and the theme this year is inquiry and the power of asking questions through poetry and answering questions through poetry. Today, we are very excited to have with us Andrea Deacon. And Andrea will be in conversation with John Gillespie. John was the president of the board of the Stockbridge Library Association for several years, um, but has moved out of the area to Maine where he is joining us from today. Andrea is joining us from Portland, Oregon. So we're really coast to coast in today's session. Um, a little bit about our poet before I turn the program over. Andrea was born in rural Missouri and her writing has appeared or is forthcoming in Beltway Poetry Quarterly, Beyond Queer Words, The Blue Mountain Review, Spoon River Poetry Review, Valley Voices and others. Her awards include an honorable mention in the 2019 Spoon River Poetry Review Editor's Prize Contest and a second place in the 2020 Blue Mountain Review LGBTQ Chapbook Contest. Her debut chapbook, Mother Kingdom, won the 2021 Slapering Hall Press Chapbook Contest and was published in 2022 by Slapering Hall Press, which is a small imprint of the Hudson Valley Writers Center. A former book editor, she has worked at the Multnomah County Library for 15 years. So um, sharing libraries. libraries here as well. Um, so Andrea, thank you for joining us. So delighted to have you. I will turn the program over to you and to John. No, Wendy, thanks. Thanks for taking it off and hosting. And uh, Holly, thank you. We're live from Miami. So I think we've got West Coast, Southeast, uh, Northeast. Uh, we don't. We need someone in New Mexico. I think that's our next our next option. Uh, no, great. Now, uh, now, Andrea, though, uh, great to have you again to read for us. So, let's just start off and tell me or share with Holly and and our other people who see it later on. You know, what does inquiry mean to you? How does that work? Oh, thank you, John, and thank you, Wendy. I'm really excited to be back uh, for season three. Thanks for having me. Um, I guess when I think of inquiry, I I think of that that moment of um, pausing um, and this idea of kind of like open presence, which can be taken um, both in the way that I think I approach writing or try to, but also just to kind of in my daily life. Um, I think that like many of us, I sort of have a constant chatter in my mind um and it's really easy to just miss the moment that you're in um and I think with writing I try to approach my my ideas with just this this sort of like open curiosity but that that's also without judgment ideally um and I think I I learn a lot of this from my daughter because she she's nine years old she's in fourth grade right now she's just obsessed with animals and not only like mammals, like, you know, dogs and cats, but she loves insects. And so she's constantly turning over rocks, looking for bugs. Um, sometimes when it's bedtime and we should be getting ready for bed, I, I can't find her and she'll be in the backyard with a flashlight looking for crickets. <laughs> um, and well, there's this part of me, I have these two selves, right? That's the self that's like, it's bedtime, we have to go to bed. What are you doing? And this other self is like, wait a minute, like she's inviting me into her world. And there is a cricket there. I didn't notice there was a cricket there. So I, I think with writing, it's interesting because um, so many of these conversations, like they start with me uh, in nature, right? And um, they often will lead to, to sort of further explorations because I mean, every poem does start with, an inquiry of, of some sort, like an investigation. Um, but I think ideally, and I was talking about this with a friend of mine, the writer Darla Himalais, she was saying that uh, th you can start with a question in a poem, but ideally when that poem is finished, I mean, if a poem is ever finished, when when the, the writer is happy with it, um, 
enough to let it go. It's not like it's a closed answer then. I mean, because ideally it's still sort of open to the artist's um, investigation into themselves, if that makes sense. So it's, it's like yeah. never finished, right? Yeah, let's just play that out. So I think, no, I'm just trying to understand. So if you ask a question, even though, you know, the poem may have a, a physical ending on the page, the answer of the question is still kind of in, in progress. It's still percolating. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't end because the poem ends. It, it may still be going on. And you right. may even go back and read the poem again and think about something different when you read the poem. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's what's really great about art in general, because it almost just creates this ongoing conversation with um, with the person writing it or creating it, and then the person who's experienced it. I, be, I mean, I feel like I have that all the time with other art forms, not just writing, but with music. Um, and it's, it's almost like a, I feel like for me, the best art forms are the ones that inspire me to create something in return and sometimes that's also if I see myself in that creation which as a queer person you know I growing up I didn't always see that so I think like now that I know who I am have a better sense of that um part of that is because I see that reflected in in larger media and art um mm -hmm. which is so important I think to just give representation to all sorts of voices, especially voices that have been either misrepresented or underrepresented. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think the power, of, well, I think the power of the season inquiry is, you know, you, you know, you start out with, you know, maybe you start with a question, but does that, does that happen a bunch of the time or do you kind of, or just like the question emerge, you know, as you, mm. as you start, writing out the poem all of a sudden there's something that starts to arise i'm just yeah i think it depends i mean i think right now my writing usually starts with a question i mean i'm really fascinated by origin stories um and i mostly i'm just trying to figure out human behavior <laughs> like figuring out human behavior and relationships and also who i am right who i am as a a mother as a daughter, as a queer person, like what, as a, you know, as a wife, um, what, what things have I been given by um, either like my family line or the larger culture that I grew up in, which was a patriarchal culture, which was a very religious Catholic kind of uh, oppressive <laughs> culture in my mind, um, growing up in the Midwest. Uh, in the 80s and 90s. I mean, a lot of it is like, I, I, I usually start with a question and then um, that's that's sort of an entry point. But I feel like the best poems have to like marinate for a while because I, I'm, I think I'm most interested in how the personal experience can just connect to sort of like the macro. You know, right now I'm just fascinated with like, um, all these photos from the Hubble Space Telescope, like they are blowing my mind. Like I think about that, then I think about trees and how their roots um, communicate. Like I'm reading this book about how we have this this idea that like if you cut down a tree, you can just you know plant one. But actually, trees they're they almost like uh, really healthy forests. They they sort of congregate in families. Like you'll have like like all these sort of like older trees and then their children next to them and all and all the roots are connected and they almost they can communicate to each other if they need um you know if, if like a fire is coming for example like that kind of stuff blows my mind so then it's uh, for me it's all about like place like where do i fit into that and like how do i be <sighs> a citizen of the world i don't know it's, it's sort of a lot but i think that's but yeah, the entry point to the poem is always the question of, you know, whatever I happen to be wrestling with, which, you know, it's life. There's always something. <laughs> and, and where you live, there's a lot of questions. Oh, yeah. I tell you, if there's yeah, one city, definitely. Portland, Oregon, if there's one city that's the, I don't know, what, what do we call it? P 
people consider it. I, on the East Coast, I, I mean, people write about the, the leftist capital of the United States. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I feel, no. wasn't it called like Little Beirut for a while? I feel like, didn't George W. Bush Sr. call it that for a while back in like the 90s? Yeah. I don't remember. Right. Yeah, it definitely. We have, I mean, Portland has a reputation for definitely being counterculture and leftist. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I love that about this city, you know? And it's like, how do we, how do we move forward in a world that is so often just, you know, mirrored by chaos and, and misinformation, you know, and how do we start to trust one another again? Like, I just think about like, what, what is, it's hard to know what's even real anymore. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's, it's a very unstable feeling, which to me, that gets back to like presence, like being present in my body. Yeah. You know, when I, when I get, when I feel the most despair is when I know that I need to go to the woods and yeah. just be in the trees and then i feel i feel like i can breathe a little bit better you know <laughs> yeah yeah i think uh i always remember the wendy's commercial remember her name clara what's her name she was about five foot one show me the beef you oh, know, yeah. she said that and then she was on for years she was on for years mm-hmm. she became an international celebrity i feel like with politics hey show me the proof <laughs> stop talking right. about it and show me the proof uh, yeah, where's right. the beef? Yeah. Right. So, Andrea, why don't you share share a few poems with us, please? Oh, definitely. Um, yeah, so I wanted to read some poems from my chapbook, Mother Kingdom, which came out in March from Slappering Hall Press. And there are, there are many micro press out in the Hudson Valley um, as part of the Hudson Valley Writer Center. Um, a recent thing that's exciting is I just found out uh, it was a finalist in the International Book Awards for the, the chapbook category. So I got these cute little stickers. <laughs> yeah. so that was exciting. Also, um, it's now available in a couple local bookstores in Portland. Um, so that's exciting too. But so I thought I would start with a poem called Evolution. A lot of the poems in here are about um, motherhood, but they're also not necessarily about being a mother in the tra- traditional sense. It's also about how to be a mother to yourself. And they're also about like identity and queerness, but the the place of the the poems in many ways is the the um, where I grew up in Missouri out in the country, and so that that almost takes on like a, a separate uh, character of the chapbook. Um, so this poem is called Evolution, and it starts where my father is searching for arrowheads in a field where uh, near where we, I grew up out in the woods. So this one is evolution. Was it when I followed my father to the fields, his back hunched, searching for arrowheads, my feet sinking in the newly turned earth? Or was it seeing my mother from the doorway, her back a waning crescent in the dark? Words came easily to me then, alone with paper, my mind a sweet shadow, Time a blanket around my shoulders. But coming out my mouth, they choked and stumbled. My face, the crushed color of cherries, stuck to the bottom of a boot. When I told my father I was gay, he was chopping radishes, their red skins, half moons on the cutting board. Little gleams of white, like a promise worth keeping. His careful hands slicing, their rough wintered edges that held so many things, dogs, babies, stones the color of starlight, my wild heart beating the knife's calm rhythm. What can I fix you to eat? My mother was not so easy. Her face pinched pale in the thick dark of her bedroom, thin covers, a moat of righteous limbs, and I the only sinner. Even now, all these years later, my heart closes when I hear her voice. Today it's cold, but the crocuses are coming up. Ochre pollen petals, small as thimbles. Soon the geese will head back north, their black wings cutting through soundless clouds. Oh, my, heart, my heart closes when I hear her voice. Wow. <laughs> um, 
the next one I'm, I thought I would read is called Before Girls There Was God. And the setting of this one is Catholic school, high school. Um, there was a retreat that a lot of girls would go on and senior year called Teens Encounter Christ. Uh, and this one is sort of about, you know, a, rec a reckoning of identity and um, sort of misplaced feelings, I should say. So this one's called Before Girls There Was God. When I was young, I'd ask my father to go to work with him. Sweaty Missouri summers, Mountain Dew and Junior Mints, cutting grass at the city cemetery. He put me on a riding mower at 10. I had it precisely mapped out. Three passes for each row, my skinny legs stuck to the hot black seat. The blade lined up just so to get close enough to the graves without scraping the sides. At 17, I got religion. For three days, Catholic girls in sleeping bags held hands our Bibles tucked lovingly between us. My mother's idea, a retreat will do you good. All the girls were going. I didn't think much of it, just another chore until I saw her that first night. Darla, the counselor in college, a gold cross nestled in the hollow of her neck, kissed tan with summer. She smelled like coconut lotion, and juicy fruit, the clove cigarettes she'd sneak at lunch. When she smiled at me, I felt saved. I came back from that weekend filled with the Holy Spirit, thinking of her taut calves, the tiny blonde hairs just above her knees, the way she said my name. On the mower, it was always one pass on the left side, the same thing on the right, my father coming behind me with the string trimmer to get the grass just right between the graves, all the edges I'd missed. He sliced through those blades of stinging July grass like they were silk. But it was the third pass, the last pass that was my favorite. I called it the middle. I'd floor the motor as fast as it could go riding on top of those sun-setting souls, bound by the old law. I was still alive, flying, free. Ah, very nice. Very nice. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, I, the next one is called um, We Carry Stones with Seasons Inside Them. This one came about because my daughter at the time was obsessed with um, finding rocks to make these little stacks. We had read a book about kids who went on a hike and they had too many rocks to take back with them. And so they would leave a little stack um, sort of to like, you know, say that they were there on the hike. And so we were trying to do that near this river near our house in Portland, it's the Columbia River, and it wasn't working out. Um, but this, uh, the other part of this poem that I was sort of, you know, in investigating is that Sometimes I I'll have these moments as a parent where suddenly I'm just back in my own childhood. And it's just interesting how you can sort of leap time just by having a moment. But this time, instead of the child, I, would be, I was the parent in that um, dynamic, which is something I never expected with being a parent. Um, so this one's called, We Carry Stones with Seasons Inside Them. Newly six, my daughter fills her fists with rocks to stack from the bruised edge of the Columbia, just north of our house in the city. She squints and stomps like a displeased general. Everything has gone wrong. The wind and water stretch around us, a large lumbering animal rubbing its eyes. It will be fall in a few weeks. Mama, they are too small, she says not flat enough for the fierce towers in her mind. Her legs blur as she charges ahead. Soon she is on to, to the next item of business, but I'm left searching. How much she starts that I take on as my own, what motherhood is, 
the push and pull of waves at the shore. I pocket those that call to me, mostly smooth ones giving me a kind of peace, probably the closest thing to prayer I've ever felt, river rock to skin. We walk to the top of the boat ramp, jagged concrete ridges reminding me of the time when I was seven or eight and played hide and seek with the summer people a half mile from our house on the Osage. I don't remember if I was it when I fell, slicing my knee on those steep steps, blood caught in the grooves. I looked for a boat full of people, coolers and catfish, tackle hanging off the sides. Instead, there was only murky water, bloated bugs and old beer cans, my blood. Someone's cousin carried me all the way, running toward our cabin at the end of the tree-lined gravel. Windows dark, the dogs barking. It's bad, you're gonna need stitches. My sweaty hands held his neck. Already shrinking into myself, I shrugged it off a summer blossom closing at dusk. At the hospital, they gave me six stitches. The boy had been right. It was my body and I was the last to know. Hmm. Um, I think I have one more if there's time for one more. It's yeah, one short. more and then, uh, uh, you know, we always have a little Q and A, so I want Holly yeah. to uh ask us some questions or provide sure. some comments yeah um this one is probably one of the most political poems i have in here well I mean, there's a couple but um this one's called poem for my daughter on the day they announced the end of the world and it's just that it's about uh hearing something on the radio while you're doing something like very innocuous like making lunch and it's so easy to ignore but at the same time if you really thought about it you would maybe sink into despair or I don't know, try to like change something. Um, anyway, this one's called Poem for My Daughter on the Day They Announced the End of the World. The radio said there had been a mistake. The oceans, in fact, are 60% warmer than we thought. I'm cutting broccoli quickly to put in a pot to boil. Quickly, because I have to leave to pick you up from school, to take you to the dentist, where they will examine your tiny teeth, smooth white chiclets, small as my pinky nail, and later there won't be time. There is never enough time. The laundry remains unfolded days after it comes out of the dryer. Weeds grow through the bark chips, dandelion seeds you wildly blow. No matter how I try, I can never get to the root. You can count to 60 in two languages. This morning at breakfast, 16, 17, 18, Mama, are you listening? Now the pot nearly boils over, catching the thin skin of my wrist. Bloom of pain petal, sink pollen, the crust of the oatmeal bowl. It seems the earth is more sensitive to climate than we realize. I know it's time to go. Five minutes till the last bell. You'll be left too long, and I can't bear the thought of you waiting. Hmm. All these great experiences. So Holly, uh, you know, chime in, ask them quite, you know, Holly knows my standard comment is, <laughs> don't let the poet get off easy. Uh, <laughs> Well, I've, I've just enjoyed taking notes of the different poems you've been reading and listening. Um, my ears went up right away because I am from Missouri and I am a Catholic school kid. So get it. I'm a, I'm a Catholic school kid, <laughs> at least Catholic for the first school. five years. So, yeah. yeah. Where where in Missouri are you from? I'm from St. Louis. Oh, I, I oh, right, right, yeah. City mostly. Yeah. Where? Uh, Jefferson City. Oh yeah, I mean, when you said Osage River, I'm thinking over by Columbia, Jefferson City. Yeah, yeah, and I thought, wow, she speaks so normally. You know, it's like she doesn't have an accent. 
Anyway, on your last poem about the um, the end of the world, what was the title? The radio. Oh, um, the title is "Poem for My Daughter on the Day They Announced the End of the World." Um, I well, I live in Miami, and my kids are uh, Hispanic Americans, and we all speak Spanish and don't look like it. So, um. I, what's, what's undergirding some of what that poem to me is saying, there's this awful tension between the mundane and the stuff in the dryer and she's coming home and it's this intimate, contrasting with this radio blaring catastrophe and they may have gotten it wrong and I've got to get there. And then there's the two languages. And I think it's this kind of, maybe I take it this way, but I feel there's this stealthy message of, we need a lot of languages to navigate how complicated it is. And yet on a physical plane with those close relationships, most of it's a connection that's unspoken. So it's a beautiful set of contrasts going on in that poem. I really, I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I just think a lot about uh, there's that, you know, the poet Marie Howe, she has mm -hmm. that poem, What the Living Do, and I was thinking of reading that, reading that a little bit later, but it's true, it's like, there's just, daily life can just take up so much time, especially when you have a child, and it's so easy to just push everything else out, but then sometimes there are these moments where you just need to step back and say, um, I mean, what are we doing, <laughs> you know, and it, the whole point is that there's a planet for my child. Like I want there to be a world where she lives, that she feels safe, where the planet feels safe, where, you know, all people feel safe and loved. And yeah, I don't think I really uh, realized that I was doing that work with the two languages, but that's, that's um, sometimes I just, it just, the poem just happens and I don't really know what's happening. It's almost like it comes from somewhere else, but yeah, I, I do. I like that idea too, because it's true. It's like, we're going to need a lot of different um perspectives and ideas if we're ever going to solve the climate crisis um, and i think a lot of your readers whether you are aware of it or not so many of us in this country are at least bilingual and we may yeah. oh they're not reading my poems but they're reading your poems so yeah that's great i mean my daughter we're very, very fortunate to our neighborhood school is a spanish immersion school so she's been doing spanish immersion since kindergarten um, and I have a little Spanish from my, uh, my schooling, but I've, I've lost a lot of it over time. And I think she's already in fourth grade surpassed my abilities. <laughs> she, 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 with it maybe. she corrects my accent all the time. And then I'm like, oh yeah, that is how you say it. You sound a lot better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Andrew, what I liked is what you said is, you know, part of the poem is you don't know where it came from. And I think that's, that's me like every art form that is just like this amazing part of i don't know you could call it divine intervention you could call it uh the blaring radio you could yeah it's just uh no i just yeah it's like someone i don't know it's like one of those movies where someone puts their hand on you and they start writing you're not writing but someone's got their hand in there uh i don't know what that movie was but uh no i mean it no, I think the creative process. So let me just ask you a couple, a question is, and you probably answered this last year. <clears throat> do you have a designated time for your writing or, you know, I mean, you're in your, it looks like you're in your, you know, uh, quasi office bedroom. I never know anymore with people. Uh, so, you know, just tell us about how you, how you approach poetry. Um, that's the eternal question, right? Um, yeah, this is this is sort of our spare room slash home office slash storage space slash workout space. Um, I, you know, I work at the library part time, um, and I also am a, a, a caregiver for my daughter. Um, you know, because my wife works full time as a nurse, and so I'm often doing a lot of care tasks. And I think like. What I'm learning is I need to make space for my writing. And um, it's hard to do that sometimes in the day-to-day, -day, especially now that school has 
started and I keep, I keep having this feeling where every week I say to myself, okay, this week is going to feel less busy. This week I'm going to like have some more structure to my time, but I'm realizing that every week is busy and I'm only going to be able to, um, write and get some work done if I actually set aside, set aside some dedicated time to it for it, because and in the past, I've just been very deadline motivated. So if I find a deadline, then I can work on some stuff. But I think if it's more of like a nebulous thing, like for example, right now I'm working on some new poems for um, what I hope to be uh, my, my first full length collection, which is a long process. Um, and I think that because I have to structure that time myself, it's more difficult for me. But um, I've been reading this book by Elizabeth Gilbert that you probably have heard of, heard of called Big Magic. And she talks a lot about uh, sort of inspiration and creativity for all, for everyone, not just people who, um, not just artists, but for everyone who are interested in creativity. And she talks about the importance of making space for it. And she also talks about how, I mean, her opinion is that it is some sort of outside force that if you're, you're not open and ready to that idea, it will go to the next person, right? She has yeah. a whole story about how she was gonna write a book about a very specific plot point, And then she didn't write it because her life got in the way. And then Ann Patchett wrote the exact same book and they only realized it because they became friends. And it was like very specific uh, plot points, you know? And it was like the second that, she, that Elizabeth stopped working on it, then the idea came to Ann Patchett. Just mystical stuff like that, I'm really into. So I'm trying to just create space to be open. Um, it's it's a work in progress for sure. <laughs> I often, you know, I try to have a notebook with me because I, I get ideas at sort of like the worst times. I'll get a sentence in my head and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to, I have to write that down. But I'm like, you know, doing school pickup or something. So, so is it one of many libraries in? Is a, a you a library in Portland? Yeah, I work at the Hollywood Library, so it's one library. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I think the Portland, Maine. You know, it's funny you're in Portland. I'm close to Portland, Maine. And I think Portland, Maine. They, they have about three or four branches, so it's a pretty big, pretty big operation. Yeah, we have we have a lot of locations too. I think we have like over ten now. Wow. Um But I I, I let you know in the past. Before I had a kiddo, I would work at all the libraries and pick up hours, but um, now I'm just sort of at one one location. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So you want to read uh, a few more poems for us? Oh, sure. Yeah, actually, um, I thought I would read some other poets um, because I love reading other poets. So I, I just got this book uh, by Rilke when I was traveling, and this one's really Rilke. cool because it was... <laughs> It was translated by Robert Bly. Oh and boy, so you're right up of... in the Mount Olympus of <laughs> translations. Yeah. So yeah, so some of the, when I was thinking about inquiry, um, and these are these are short. I'm just gonna read a couple from him. But so these are from his book. Uh, so so Bly translated it, it as a book for the hours of prayer. So it says the German title suggests a medieval monk's or nun's handbook of prayers. So this one. Um, this one's just called, it's the title number five. Okay, it goes like this. You darkness that I come from, I love you more than all the fires that fence in the world. For the fire makes a circle of light for everyone. And then no one outside learns of you. But the darkness pulls in everything, shapes and fires, animals and myself. How easily it gathers them powers and people and it is possible a great energy is moving near me i have faith in nights mm, i love that one it gives me chills i just love that idea of like loving the darkness which is such a hard thing to do you know yeah david white did an interpretation on one of his cds or something about the the, the energy means something different uh oh. for for us it yeah. doesn't, it does, It means, I don't know what it means. I, I'd have to go back and listen to some stuff, but he had, he had a little Rilke uh, dive bomb on, on some stuff anyway. The darkness, so darkness, yeah. And then the, uh, oh, cool. 
Yeah, because he speaks German. So okay, besides I uh, Welsh and English and probably a bunch of other stuff. So yeah, yeah, great. No, it's a great yeah. You darkness, yeah. I was so keep going, going yeah. By, yeah, by him too. This one's just called number seven. I haven't read a ton of Rilke, so I was I was excited to find this book. Um, so this is number seven. I am too alone in the world and not alone enough to make every minute whole, holy. I am too tiny in this world and not tiny enough just to lie before you like a thing, shrewd and secretive. I want my own will and I want simply to be with my will as it goes toward action and in the silent, sometimes hardly moving times when something is coming near. I want to be with those who know secret things or else alone. I want to be a mirror for your whole body and I never want to be blind or to be too old to hold up your heavy and swaying picture. I want to unfold. I don't want to stay folded anymore because where I am folded, there I am a lie. And I want my grasp of things true before you. I want to describe myself like a painting that I looked at closely for a long time, like a saying that I finally understood, like the picture I use every day, like the face of my mother, like a ship that took me safely through the wildest storm of all. Oh my God, it's so good. Yeah. I love so that what idea. Is that, what's of like that one with? Uh, yeah, what's, yeah, what's the one with him, the question? You know, stay with the question and the answer will come to you. You know that one? Oh, I don't think so. I'll have to listen to that one. My favorite is the uh, the archaic torso that he's describing this uh, headless ancient Greek blah, blah, lines mm -hmm. and, lines and lines and lines and lines. And he's describing every anatomical to the light on the stone. And it ends with, you must change your life. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a, a mystic, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, I thought I'd read one too. I got this book, The October Palace by Jane Hirschfield. And I wanted to read one poem from here too that I was struck by called The Kingdom. At times the heart stands back and looks at the body, looks at the mind as a lion quietly looks at the not quite itself, not quite another, moving of shadows and grass. Wary, but with interest, considers its kingdom. Then seeing all that will be, heart once again enters, enters hunger, enters sorrow, enters finally losing it all. To know, if nothing else, what it once owned. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Yeah, put the Rilke. Oh. oh good. Yeah, be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. I, I listen, I've used this so many times with people. Do oh, not wow. seek the answers which cannot be given to you or given you because you will not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing, live along some distance, distant day into the answer. I'm like, every time I read that, I'm like, okay, no answers. <laughs> Let me just stay with the question. Yeah. Fantastic. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, do I have time for like two more? How much absolutely, time do we have? absolutely. We, we're we got to be finished by midnight, so we only have eleven hours. No, 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 no. We. We have a good good 15 minutes or so, so all good. Oh, great. Well, I wanted to read that poem that I mentioned by Marie Howe, What the Living Do, because I think it really taps into that idea of the, the mundane. Um, and then also just the larger questions. This book is just so beautiful. It's about her, her brother's, um, it's about her childhood, but also her brother uh, dying of AIDS. So this is the last poem in the book. Um, what the Living Do. Johnny, the kitchen sink has been clogged for days. Some utensil probably fell down there and the Drano won't work. 
what smells dangerous, and the crusty dishes have piled up. Waiting for the plumber, I still haven't called. This is the every day we spoke of. It's winter again. The sky's a deep, headstrong blue, and the sunlight pours through the open living room windows because the heat's on too high in here, and I can't turn it off. For weeks now, driving or dropping a bag of groceries in the street, the bag breaking, I've been thinking, this is what the living do. And yesterday, hurrying along those wobbly bricks in the Cambridge sidewalk, spilling my coffee down my wrist and sleeve, I thought it again and again later when buying a hairbrush. This is it, parking slamming the car door shut in the cold. What you called that yearning. What you finally gave up. We want the spring to come and the winter to pass. We want whoever to call or not call. A letter, a kiss. We want more and more and then more of it. But there are moments walking when I catch a glimpse of myself in the window glass say the window of the corner video store, and I'm gripped by a cherishing so deep for my own blowing hair, chapped face, an unbuttoned coat, that I'm speechless. I am living. I remember you. Mm. Ugh, I love her so much. Yeah, I saw her at Kapalu. She had like a couple hour event as part of their R&R &R stuff. Yeah, she was... Mm. Amazing. I would love to see her read. Yeah. Um, I just have one more. I have a new one I'm working on. It's called The Grief Factory. I'm going to pull it up on my computer here. I was sort of, with this poem, I was sort of imagining, like, what if grief could be a tangible thing you could hold in your hands? If we could sort of see a physical representation of what grief is. So... This one's The Grief Factory, and it's my last poem. Thank you again for having me. This is so wonderful. Oh. Um, I love this series. So, The Grief Factory. At first, stones, rows of them, the quiet calm, the trajectory of the conveyor belt, the hands of the workers adjusting for shape and size. The Grief Factory keeps odd hours. It is usually open in the dead of night. Stone after stone passed down the moving belt, a living record of the grief the world has made. Backs bent to the never ending task of assembly, to what has been lost. An absence of touch, the sound of your mother's voice and how their hands could be my own. In the grief factory, they are churning out sadness in the shape of small stones. They number in the hundreds, pile up at the workers' feet. Their job is to stack them until the rocks become a wall, too high to climb, until they begin to run out of room. So unaccustomed is the world to love. One day, I filled in at the factory, and after eight hours on the floor, I looked down in shock. Instead of river rocks, smooth and heavy at the throat, ripe for stacking, suddenly there were flowers, purple petals, stamens long and yellow, falling in soft piles at my feet. Each and every rock my heart had once held for you now turned to flowers in my hands. And that's when I knew you were really gone, forever lost to me and all the ways you've chosen to use your love as a weapon, a garden growing in the feet of my letting go. Thank you. Yeah, I think you, I think you uh, topped off our latte on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Holly, any final comments or questions? I, I, well, as you were starting to read The Grief Factory, I was coming up with this whirl of ideas that really didn't settle into something solid. But, you know, you started off um, with a lot of identity statements and you mentioned Catholic and you mentioned Missouri 
and that it, you know, it was the 80s, which was a pretty, the beginning of like reactionary Catholicism, which was a reaction to very progressive opening up Catholicism of the 60s, which was my experience. And that's the heartening thing to me of when there's this horrible reactionary time, it's always in response to an opening up. So there will be another opening up. And then every poet you chose to read one of their poems is basically a religious poet, whether they would call it a religion or not, but their spiritual practice is definitely present in their work. Um, so it's very, it's all very large. And so I love that that largeness is in your poems. Oh, and I love that, thank you. Small at the same time. <laughs> Andrea, we're giving you a lot of free material here. <laughs> I love it. I don't think I knew that about the Catholic Church, actually. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I'd have to, that makes a lot of sense, though. I mean, it, that actually kind of gives me hope for the future in some ways, because yeah. we, we are in a very difficult time, I think, politically, and I'm hoping there's something on the other side, something else that we can make that yeah. serves everyone and the planet, you know? One of the things that I said a couple of weeks ago about inquiry was that when I was in high school, we had these young progressive nuns who said that faith isn't worth anything if it's, if it's not doubted. If it's untested, it has no strength at all. And they sent us out into the world very on fire to do good things. And they needed to shut that down real fast. Because first of all, you know, women who have library cards is way too scary. And then nuns that tell girls to doubt their faith, watch out. So the reaction is a is a compliment to that opening. It'll open, it'll keep opening. It will. Oh, I, nice. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Wendy, you didn't grow up Catholic, did you? Good, good. You're Wendy, now consider yourself saved. <laughs> joke no uh no uh no andrea thank you very much uh really refreshing to have you read again and holly thank you for you know rowing in the boat on this one and and just riding along oh, i'm so it. glad i could make it i really yeah, just to a, make it yeah yeah Those no this is, work good luck with your first man that's a huge uh threshold Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for taking the time. This was really wonderful. This was a great Is conversation. Consider sending it to Corey Press. Do you know them? I don't think so. How do you spell it? K O R E. Check it out. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Andrea, thank you so much for reading for us and sharing your work and your process and the work of some other poets that influence you. That was really wonderful. Um, and next week we have no online poetry session because it's election day. So yeah, I forgot about election. Yeah, we don't have a program next week. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, we didn't want to confuse the public with uh, poetry hour on election day. That could want to make Andrea. Sure there could be another radio blast coming the around. There's the library doing that stuff again. <laughs> yeah, we just don't want anything to get in the way of people's ability to vote. So yeah, that's thank right. Thank you, Andrea, again, so very much. And we'll yeah. see everyone in two weeks. Holly, great to see you. Andrea, 